Everybody see it? Mm -hmm. Yep. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the uh, August meeting of Central Park United Neighbors. I am uh, C Puns President Jeff Horsfall. Thank you again for joining us. Um, Brian, do you mind going to the next slide? I'll just tell everybody a little bit about our organization. Um, Steve Pun is the registered neighborhood organization for the Central Park community in Denver. Uh, we are here to facilitate dialogue and create awareness around the opportunities to engage on topics of importance to this community. Uh, we help people to find their way into a process so that resident questions, concerns, and ideas for a better community can be addressed in a constructive and inclusive way. We promote public service, civil civic discourse, and collective efficacy. Uh, at our monthly meetings and through the work of our uh, various working committees, CPUN facilitates the discussion of key issues with neighbors, engages in pro proactive problem avoidance and amicable problem solving. CPUN is committed to providing an inclusive and welcoming environment for all members of our community. Uh, for those of you that don't know, uh, CPUN is an all volunteer board of your neighbors and we are a registered 501c3. Our agenda tonight, as always, starts with the outreach portion of our community meeting. So um, that will include some updates from the committees I mentioned earlier, uh, a number of uh, updates from various community partners. And then we have a, a special guest that will be joining us this evening um, and a Central Park resident herself, Alexandra Foster, who's the uh, communications program manager uh, for the Office of Community Planning and Development with uh, the city and county of Denver. This is actually the office that oversees the RNO network um, for the city and county of Denver, uh, so CPUN being among them. Then we'll wrap up with a public comment before moving on to our board meeting. Um, Brian, next slide, uh, please. We have a full uh, agenda tonight. We'll be talking a little bit about uh, the bylaw change that we proposed in our June meeting. Uh, we'll review some committee work as well as uh, get to know a couple of board can uh, potential board candidates. We have one open seat and two residents who have expressed interest in joining the board, uh, Heather Vasquez and Liz Stalnicker. So we'll get to know them a little bit. Uh, we'll then talk about Aurora representation on uh, CPUN. Currently, as you heard me say earlier, we uh, our, we represent Denver uh, residents of uh, Central Park, and we're looking at the possibility of uh, expanding that to Central Park residents in Aurora. Uh, we'll have a budget update, discuss uh, the possibility of a return to in-person meetings, and then conclude with a quick question for the board about CPUN swag. Next slide, please. Um, before we proceed, I, I do want to take a quick moment to acknowledge uh, an important anniversary. Uh, since this board last convened, we passed the first anniversary of the announcement that residents had chosen Central Park to become our new community name. Uh, changing our community name spoke to the kind of community we want to be. But it was also about what came next, and that's honoring uh, the renaming decision by continuing to challenge this community to be a better version of itself. In the last year, I've been heartened by the way our new name has been embraced by residents, businesses, the city, and others. And I've seen many examples of residents embodying the positive qualities we seek, and I'm, and I'm really proud of our community of Central Park. It's also true, though, that we still have work to do. Um, we can, can and should and need to do better. Our community must continue to find ways to be more welcoming, inclusive, and respectful. We must continue to ask ourselves what kind of community we wanna be. And if you're looking for ways to answer that question for yourself, I encourage you to reach out. Uh, Central Park United Neighbors is here to help. With that, we'll move on to uh, committee updates. I wanna first thank our community partners who've graciously agreed to give a little bit of space in this outreach hour to our committees so that we can spotlight for uh, residents some of the great work that uh, our various communities are doing. So I just kind of want to go uh, round robin here and invite all of our communities or committees to provide just a quick update about ways to uh, that uh, residents can engage um, with their work. Um, I'm just going to 
go alphabetically here, if that's okay. I hate to put anyone on the spot, but I wonder if we might start with the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusivity Committee. Is Shalise here? I'm uh, here. There she is, hi. I'm here, thank you for allowing me a moment to speak. So I'd like to welcome everyone to the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee meeting. We now hold our meetings every fourth Tuesday at 6 p.m. We also have recently opened a public survey via SurveyMonkey. If you were on the CPUN mailing list, you should have received that on Sunday in your email. We are asking that everyone please take 15 to 20 minutes to respond to the survey as we really wanna collect the data so that we can know where we need to improve and things that you are expecting from us moving forward. Um, everything can be done anonymously and we are giving a $200 gift card to one person who chooses to leave their email. There will be a drawing at the end. The survey is open from August 12th to September 12th. Um, so we're asking that everyone who can please participate. The survey is also open to residents who live in the community, people who work in the community and students or parents of children in the community. Um, so we would greatly appreciate that, but we are working to bring educational opportunities to the neighborhood um, and to have different meetings or meetups is what we're calling them, where everyone can just come out, meet other people and have a good time. So hopefully I'll meet you in person. Thank you. Thanks, Shalise. Uh, education, um, perhaps Carol? Sure. Uh, okay, the Education Committee is meeting this Thursday um, at 11.30, and we're looking to change the time. We don't know what that is, but it will obviously be on the website. I won't go into everything that we're doing, but um, one of the things that I did want to mention is that a letter, an email is going out to neighborhood public schools as to how the community can serve students, support students and possibly families, student families and staff as well. And so I'm, I've put together and I am getting feedback from members of the uh, committee as to how we're going to phrase that and offer our support. So that's going to be happening in the next couple of days. That letter's gonna go out, we'll keep you posted. And there's two other things that I'll mention that are on the calendar. Uh, one has already begun, which is the Consumption Literacy Project, and that is a public garden in the neighborhood, happens to be in my yard. And um, one thing I want to mention is that I'm seeing so much collaboration among committees. Um, there's so much crossover going on, communication and crossover and support and ideas uh, flow freely among our committees, and it's a delight. And I think that Education is one of them and the Consumption Literacy Project is part of that because now um, a member of the Sustainability Committee, um, Beth Lewis, is going to be facilitating activities around this public garden. Um, that's actually two raised beds that are on 49th place. Um, and the next activity, if Jamie is on, she can say something about that, is gonna be August 25th and it's gonna be about soil building, which will be pretty cool, I think. And then another crossover is with um, Jamie as well. There, we have been talking for a very long time about an event around celebrating indigenous people. And I know that DEI is gonna be involved with that. So um, Jamie, do you wanna say anything about that or no? She may not be uh, hi, I'm Jamie Hutchins. Um, I think that, yeah, the, so that's sort of in the planning stages. We would like to have kind of a cultural day where we um, invite an indigenous dance troupe to come to the community and share cultural stories and share cultural traditions and dances. Um, so we'll be asking for that as a budget item, I think from uh, diversity, equity and inclusion and the education committee. Um, in terms of the community garden, yes, the next event is next Wednesday. Um, we had an event uh, last month where we put oyas in the ground. This is a this is a, a water um, irrigation system that is indigenous and it is sustainable. Um, and this next week we're going to just be adding um, 
mulch and organic material to the garden bed. So if you want to come, please do and bring with you carbon rich materials, old paper, paper bags, um, fruit that is rotting off of your trees and falling to the ground. Um, so that's all of That's all welcome to be put into the garden. Thanks, Jamie. Mm -hmm. Um, why don't we move on to uh, health and safety? Yes, thanks, Jeff. Uh, so health and safety uh, last week had the opportunity to hear from uh, the task force to uh, reimagine public safety and uh, policing here in Denver. Uh, we enjoyed a very great presentation from a team of folks who from around many different uh, organizations uh, through the Denver area who came up with uh, what they're calling the five strategies uh, to reimagine public staffing, safety rather. Uh, and you know, they start, it starts with empowering the community with resources to adequately address socioeconomic needs and provide for your own public safety. Also minimizing inter unnecessary interaction of law enforcement and the criminal legal system within the community, supporting the successful community reentry of formerly incarcerated people and remove systematic barriers to reintegration and heal the community from harm by creating policing and criminal justice systems. We also, they're also looking to expand the role of community in establishing meaningful independent oversight, approving accountability, training law enforcement and creating public safety policy. After our conversations with them uh, last week and subsequent committee discussion, we think the Health and Safety Committee is uniquely positioned to pursue areas uh, surrounding mental health and behavioral health response, particularly in those acute scenarios. Uh, and we will be, uh, the committee will be continuing our dialogue with this group and many other groups about how we expand existing city services or build new city services that can provide uh, to uh, our neighbors in these acute settings. We also talked a lot about how often we are asking the police uh, to become involved in things that perhaps the police um, shouldn't be coming involved in. Uh, specifically, we talked about traffic and how there's a lot of conversation about you know, calling the police out to address a speeding vehicle. Uh, we, we talked about you know, maybe there is more effective use of the police's time. They can be going after you know, maybe the, the higher level, more concerning uh, offenses. Uh, and, and we can create a different system for addressing uh, concerns like speeding or running the stoplight. Uh, those are a lot of conversations that we continue to engage in uh, and are mindful of the various different uh, backgrounds and perspectives on that topic. Uh, uh, and this is uh, in addition to our ongoing work uh, regard, uh, surrounding uh, homelessness, uh, unhoused populations, and providing uh, resources to those in need. Thanks, Jack. Um, outreach Committee. Mark, do you want to say anything um, about perhaps fundraising? Yeah, happy, happy to uh, do so. We've got uh, a speaker this week um, from the city about our, our sort of the r &O network, uh, but also we're uh, looking at hopefully having a neighborhood survey on a variety of issues from each of the committees coming up in the next few months. Um, we've also finally got some materials together so we can go to uh, various events um, around the community when we have volunteers to do so and a good appropriate way to do so. Um, and then we've been working on sort of building up our email list and then also hopefully having a regularly more um, sort of scheduled uh, Facebook posting going on too for our outreach communications efforts. Uh, Safe Streets. Yes, hi, again. Carol, um, yeah. <laughs> Carol is also our vice president, by the way. Carol is a very uh, busy person. Here all the times. Um, and Brad is a uh, co-chair and he's going to say something in just a minute. And I look forward to actually to talking with Jack, given what he just said about policing and traffic and speeding and going through stop signs, because for the past several months, this is what we hear from our neighbors at our committee meetings. They are upset. They are tired of the speeding. Um, they are tired of being afraid on their bikes and and their children on their bikes and skateboards, et cetera. And um, so we've been hearing a lot about that. And it seems like a simple ask, but it's become very, very difficult. We want our neighbors walking and rolling throughout Central Park. And we want drivers to respect their neighbors and the law. Um, and to that end, uh, one of our members, Amy Campbell, uh, created a very succinct, uh, clear protocol for reporting egregious driving behavior and unsafe street conditions. So it's not just the driving 
and the going through the stop signs, but it's also when you see um, impediments um, in the road, that sort of thing. So she created a protocol, it's on the website. It has a police number um, that um, they, were they were taking um, messages and now you actually can talk to a real person. Um, and then there's, I'm trying to remember if Dottie, if we have a, a way to contact them as well. And then we do have a designated traffic officer for Central Park and that's Derek Pollard. And so his email is in that as well. And that's being posted on the website. And then it will also be on a number of Facebook pages that are um, with groups in Central Park. And so Brad, you can either add to that or you can um, mention the bike lanes. Yeah, um, why don't we start there? So uh, I have been, uh, you know, our committee has been really uh, good partners with Dottie and, and we learned that um, the protected bike lane on um, Central Park Boulevard, uh, which I also found out is actually gonna be the longest protected bike lane in the city of Denver outside of downtown. Um, and that is gonna start uh, construction at the end of September with a, a hopeful uh, finish date of sometime in November. Um, and we're actually going to plan uh, <clears throat> a sort of a celebratory event. Um, uh, and, you know, if it's, we'll see what the weather looks like, but if the weather's not too bad, it'd be great to go uh, get some neighbors out there on their bikes or, or even pedestrians, because uh, there's going to be some pedestrian improvements too, um, to uh, just sort of celebrate the completion of it and getting some great safe streets infrastructure in our neighborhood. So we'll, we'll keep everybody apprised of, of when that's going to happen. Thanks, Brad. And then uh, sustainability. Um, I'll just keep going on there. It's, oh, it's great. The new co-chair of it. Um, <clears throat> I'll just keep talking. Um, but uh, so sustainability committee has been doing a lot of great work. Um, Jamie already touched on the community garden part of it, um, but another really great way for neighbors to get engaged with our work on sustainability side is um, through the great work of, of a lot of different board members um, and with some uh, faculty at CU Denver, um, we've sort of released a fruit tree. Sorry if you can hear my, um, my toddler <laughs> doing banshee screams in the background, but um, I, a fruit tree map where um, neighbors can input uh, trees, fruiting trees that are in the right of way um, uh, and, and then submit them so everybody can see um, uh, where there are fruit trees that are potentially harvestable um, in the neighborhood. So um, I'm going to drop the link to the survey in the chat. So if you have a fruiting tree in your tree lawn and uh, <clears throat> are comfortable with people coming to visit it, or you know of one that's in just the general public right away or parks in the neighborhood, um, you can go submit that um, and then view on a map um, where there are fruit trees. Um, so we thought this was kind of a fun sustainability related thing where neighbors can go around and, and just see what's out there in our neighborhood. Yeah, not thanks. just uh, trees, but that. berries. Sorry, blackberries. And berries. Blackberries. <laughs> Heaven forbid if I don't mention the berries. Um, <laughs> but uh, and beyond that, um, I think uh, we also did some strategic planning for the rest of the year. And and one of our goals is really is to elevate all of our wonderful partners, including many on this call, that are nonprofits that do things related to sustainability in the neighborhood and the community. So um, if you want to get involved with uh, some of those uh, nonprofits and volunteering, um, feel free to reach out to us afterwards. Thanks. Yeah, and I'll actually report back real quickly on that. One of those endeavors this weekend, I went to the Sand Creek Regional Greenways Volunteer Day on Saturday. Um, we had about 18 neighbors out there, so it was really good turnout, and it was great to see several folks came out having seen the uh, notifications about it from our, our emails. So, um, you know, I'll We'll make sure to, to notify everyone when, when they have other uh, volunteer days in the future, as well as some other community partners. Terrific. Thanks, everybody. I really appreciate it. And if you're here watching this or you're listening or watching the recording later and uh, anything that was described here sounds like it's interesting to you, I'd encourage you to uh, go to our website, uh, centralparkunitedneighbors.com. All of our committees have pages and contact information and uh, Hope you'll join us and I can't believe this but we are on time and I'm going to keep us going uh, with uh, updates from our community uh, partners and I'd like to start with uh, the Denver Police Department Lieutenant Hines and Officer Jenkins I believe you're both here. Yes we are uh, thanks so much for having us tonight and uh, Brad in a moment you're going to hear my toddler screaming in the background too. <laughs> for your part of it. Uh, so I'll just run you through some quick updates so we can keep you on time here. Uh, first, I want to do, I do want to uh, clarify with regards to traffic enforcement. Uh, DPD is still actively involved in that and we do have a traffic officer 
assigned to District 5, who specifically handles the issues we're hearing about in District 5. Uh, Carol, I believe you've communicated with uh, uh, the, our officer a number of times, and he is out there trying to uh, address your concerns and will continue to do so. Uh, a couple issues that are plaguing the area I want to uh, re-emphasize here. We are seeing a lot of stolen cars this year. It's a metro-wide problem, but we're certainly having them here in District 5. And we're also seeing catalytic converters stolen at an alarming rate throughout the metro area. One thing I will say is that the areas that are being hit the hardest with these are areas where there's long-term parking. An example of this would be the Central Park Park and Ride where people are parking when they head out to the airport, uh, a lot of times and flying out of town. So we're finding some of our victims who have been victimized out there have sometimes a two or a three week time frame where they're saying, uh, you know, the car got stolen sometime in here and we don't know when. So if you're gonna be parking in one of those long-term places that's not monitored, I'd really recommend doing something like a club on your steering wheel to protect your vehicle or things of that nature. Um, that does, we are working with uh, RTD as well to see what we can do to make that lot more secure, but it's not isolated to there. It's also hitting at hotels and things of that nature. Uh, moving right along, I do want to tell you guys, we did have a, a very large drug bust in uh, District 5 yesterday. Uh, we recovered what we're estimating to be about a $500,000 street value worth of uh, drugs that are going to be off the street. So um, we're pretty excited about that. Our officers did some great work on that. And uh, we're hoping that can lead to uh, some further leads to uh, disrupt the uh, flow of illegal drugs into the area. Um, just so we can keep on time here, I'll move right along and uh, introduce uh, Officer Kiara Jenkins. She's our community resource officer that covers the Central Park neighborhood and see if she has any updates. And then we'll put our uh, contact in the chat for you. And unless you guys have any questions, I'll uh, move that right along to Kira. Good evening, everyone. Um, just wanted to kind of piggyback off what Lieutenant Hines said. If you do need a club, feel free to give me a call or shoot me an email or just come by the District 5 station and we'll get you a club set up. We are also offering free gun lock. So if you are an owner of a firearm and would like a gun lock, stop by and I can get you one of those. Just a reminder for those who did register for the catalytic converter etching event, that is going to be tomorrow. So just in case, just another reminder to show up tomorrow to get your catalytic converter etched. And then lastly, the commander's meeting will be Thursday, September 16th. It'll be virtually, and I will put that information in the chat. Thank you both. Does it, anybody have any questions? No, if not, we can move along. Thank you again, uh, Lieutenant Hines and Officer Jenkins. I don't see a man, does anyone see Amanda Schultz or anyone from Council Member's office? Leia is on the call. Yes, my name is Leia. I'm one of the- Oh, I'm sorry. Hi, Leia. Hello. Do you have any uh, updates from Councilman Herndon's office that you might share? Um, we just, the only update I would have shared is we used to have reusable bags with the new bring your own bag to uh, stores. Um, we're currently out of reusable bags, but if you need reusable bags, you can talk to our office. You can email, I'll put my email in the chat um, and reach out to us and we'll get you connected to someone who does still have bags. Um, but apart from that, I think those are all the updates I have. Thanks. Great. Uh, Leigh, do you mind putting your email address in the chat? Oh, oh. Yep, officer. will do. Thank you. And CPUN might be able to help with bags soon. More on that later in the meeting. Um, Eric, I think Eric Herbst is here from Northeast Transportation Connections. Yep, yep, I'm here. Um, so yeah, Eric Herbst with the Northeast Transportation Connections. Um, I have a couple of things. Um, first one is there's the Denver Moves Everyone it's the 2050 um, kind of transportation plan for Denver. And right now is the kind of input phase of that project. Um, so I would encourage everyone, uh, if you have time to kind of go into that website and I'll post the website in the chat, but it's a kind of looking at the future of transportation for Denver. And it really kind of establishes the values 
um, that people have and communities have with transportation and mobility. Um, so it'd be great to have you know, a ton of people from the Central Park community uh, to go in there and kind of give your feedback and your values on mobility. Um, again, I'll post that in the chat. Um, that's kind of like a year and a half process. Um, the website includes kind of their timeline for what that looks like moving forward. But a lot of projects and funding for projects kind of come from these visioning plans. Um, so again, it's just really important to really think about mobility and what your values are as a community um, and give some input on that program. Um, the other big one is that Bike to Work Day is next month. We're just about a month out. It is September 22nd, which is a Wednesday. Um, I know people's kind of work looks a little different these days, um, potentially for a lot of people. So you can still participate. Uh, we encourage you still to pledge to ride for Bike to Work Day. Um, even if you can't bike that specific day on Wednesday, um, if you bike that week, we always encourage you to pledge to ride and that still kind of counts. We want people to try biking out. Uh, it's a fun day. There's a bunch of stations around Denver. Um, we're helping organizations get stations here in the Central Park community. Um, on that note, if you're looking to be involved in a station, please reach out to me. We generally have a good station at the Stanley Marketplace, as well as the Founders Green at the 29th Ave Town Center. Um, and I'd love to get some more stations out there. Um, I think I saw Diane Dieter on the call. I really want to talk to her about getting the MCA and the Cube uh, a station up there um, so that we can have something kind of up north of I-70. Um, but I'll put those links in the chat. And those are my two big things. Um, and yeah, thank you guys for always having us and letting me give you some updates. Thanks, Eric. Um, real quick, there's a question from Sarah McGregor. I don't know if it's better to direct this to Lieutenant Hines or perhaps Carol on, on safe streets, but there's a question about um, no truck sign on Emporia, but there continue to be trucks passing through large ones. Um, who, who to contact about that? I can actually speak to that, um, oh, Leah yeah. in Councilman Hernan's office. Sure, um, that's an ongoing conversation our office has um, been having with constituents as well as the Department of Transportation and Infrastructure. So if you um, want more information, um, updates on the conversation, feel free to email me, um, just leah.hartman at denvergov.org, um, and I can get you the newest update on that conversation. And if I could quickly add to that, when we do have areas that are signed no truck, we do get out there and try to enforce it. Uh, the way things are currently written, there are a lot of uh, exceptions to the uh, to the statute that allow trucks uh, to go through these areas. So in times where we have stopped them, sometimes we're finding that they are not in violation of the statute, um, but we will uh, we'll happily add that to our list if we uh, are having issues again with that or continuing to have issues. Great, thanks. Um, Sam Gary, John. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, my name is John Flanagan. I've just recently taken over for uh, my colleague, Lily, who some of you might know. She, um, uh, she's still with Denver Public Library, but she um, get transferred over to the Ford Warren Library. So we miss her dearly, but um, I'm excited to be part of this. Um, I actually worked at Sam Gary uh, when it first opened uh, and was there for four years um, and then moved back to Minneapolis for a little while and came back. And I, when I was in Minneapolis, I lived in the neighborhood that I worked in. And um, so I wanted to do that when I came back. And so I'm not only work in the neighborhood, but I live in it. So um, it's, it's been really fun. Um, I, the big news for us is that all uh, Denver Public Library locations are now open um, with not the hours aren't quite what they used to be, but um, we're working towards it. Hopefully, uh, the central library downtown just recently opened. It's not fully they're They're doing uh, some construction. Um, they're doing a big redesign down there. So um, uh, we um, but but they're open. So all, all locations are open, um, which is a, a big deal. Um, we just recently uh, started doing story times outside on Tuesdays and Thursdays at 10 a.m., um, which has been a blast. I, I did it today and we had over 100 people out there. Um, so that's been something that has been um, really missed by both 
librarians and the community. Um, we have typically have a lot of story times at Sam Gary with uh, high attendance. So that's been really wonderful to be able to do that again. Um, I'm not sure what the future holds in, in fall and with indoor programming and that sort of stuff. We're, we're still trying to figure out and kind of stay nimble with COVID protocols and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but it's been great to do that. Um, the other uh, big kind of exciting thing at Sam Gary specifically is that um, if you haven't been in a while, um, we now have a uh, something called an idea lab. It's a maker space. Um, there are, are, I think, five other locations that have it, but it's brand new to Sam Gary. So we have a 3D printer, um, a laser cutter, sewing machines, hand tools, uh, soldering, all sorts of stuff. So kind of crafty, um, as well as oh, the Adobe, lots of uh, computer software, and eventually. It's not open yet, but we have a, a recording studio. Um, so it's uh, super duper exciting. Um, we're especially trying to spread the word to teens and adults because we've had a lot of families coming in. Um, it's very, very popular, but um, we'd like to spread the word to, it's, it's available to everybody. Um, it's the hours, right now it's open uh, 1230 to, I'm sorry, one, one to 530 um, Tuesday through Friday and then noon to 4.30 on Saturday. And eventually that will probably expand as well to most of our hours. But that's that's been the big thing. Um, we're just happy to be open. And um, you know, we were able to do curbside service uh, while we were closed, but uh, having people back in the library and you know, especially families has been um, just really wonderful for us. So uh, we're excited about that. Thanks, John. We're, we're glad to, as are my two little girls who, uh, frequent Sam Gary often. Uh, we'll miss uh, Lily. She's been a good friend to us for a long time, but we're glad to have you as a regular part of these meetings. I don't know if you saw in the chat, but Amanda had a fond memory of you specifically from uh, Sam Gary uh, many years ago, if, if you want to take a look at that. Well, and all those, those kids are all a lot older now, so it, <laughs> it's been really fun. Even, even just COVID, seeing these kids that were toddlers that are now preschoolers. So it's, it's been yeah. fun to watch the kids grow up. So I'm very happy to be, to be back. So thank you. Thanks for joining us. Um, Mercy Housing, I think, Ellen, Ellen were you, you were able to get in, right? Or is it Sarah? So I think we're both here. Oh, you're both here, good. Yeah, I saw Ellen right. a second ago. Oh, she's on mute. Um, I'm here. Here I am. I just wanted to introduce you, Sarah, just say, you know, it's nice that you offer us this opportunity. And I wanted to introduce our new resident services coordinator at Bluff Lake Apartments because um, you guys up in Central Park have been really supportive, of real recently actually, um, with our school supply drive and other things going on. So I just wanted you to meet and see Sarah Schaefer, who will be your point of contact at Bluff Lake. So take it away, Sarah, let us know what's going on. Yep, so I just started a month ago, so I'm still kind of learning everything, but we had our um, backpack or our school supply drive yesterday, and it was great. Um, about 15 families, so even more than 15 kids, but 15 families came and the kids got to choose their backpack and fill it up with supplies. Um, it was, I unfortunately, I don't have any photos. We didn't do a photo release, but it really was wonderful. The kids were super jazzed. Um, and then, so if anyone on the line, if any of you were some of the anonymous donors of those items, thank you so much. Um, and then we have our drop-off or like our donation drop-off day. Let me double check my calendar here. Um, it is, I think it's the second Thursday, yes, it is the second Thursday of every month from 11 to 3, so I just, um, last, yep, last week we had a couple ladies come out with some school supplies and some other stuff for us, so thank you to those ladies, but yeah, anytime you guys have donations that you'd like to bring, um, definitely feel free to bring them on that second Thursday from 11 to 3. Um, I'll put my contact in the little chat box. Um, so if that time doesn't work, give me a ring and we can always set something else up. Um, at the moment, I'm not entirely sure what type of donations we're in need of. Again, I'm still quite new, so I'm sorry about that. Um, but yeah, but thus far, it's been it's been very, very pleasant. I grew up just a little bit um, west of here in the Lowry slash um, um, oh, Crestmore Downs um, area. And actually, Jeff, I went to grad school with your wife. I was one year above her. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, when I started to see your name in the emails, I'm like, wait, is that the same? 
Um, there, there's not many horse falls. I, I, yeah. <laughs> but no, I went to school with Jamie. <laughs> yeah, oh, that's um, funny. I'll mention that to her. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, and then, I mean, from what I understand, you guys are fairly familiar with Mercy Housing and what it is and everything, but just in case anyone has questions, like I said, I'll put my, um, my contact information in the chat box. So you guys are always welcome to reach out if you have any questions or if there's anything you need from us. Uh, Sarah, if you don't mind, maybe you could put the, those times and any relevant links to where people might find um, the, the supplies or, that are in need uh, when, when that list is ready, that kind of stuff, anything like that in the chat, it tends to be helpful for people to kind of copy and paste it into. Absolutely. We don't have it. I don't have like a working list. Um, if that's something that you guys would like, I can definitely start working and make one. But yeah, I don't have like a working live document list at the moment. Um, I'm willing to bet around the holiday times. Um, people will tell me if that's something that's pretty standard for us to make. Um, but, but yes, I'm, I'm planning on attending most of these meetings, so I will definitely keep you guys updated on our needs. <laughs> uh, well, thank you for joining us. I re really appreciate it. It's nice to meet you. Yes, you as well. Um, and finally, uh, we have a new but very familiar addition to this portion of our meeting. Diane Dieter from the MCA has uh, graciously agreed to to join us on an ongoing basis to provide a, an update from the um, from the MCA on some of their pools, parks, and uh, programming that they've got coming up. All right, thank you all. I did post. We have our um, one of our quarterly board meetings tomorrow at noon via Zoom, and I did post the link to that to get signed up for it if you're interested. So that's that's on the chat. Um, one thing, diversity signs, we have tried to do a little diversity campaign with the keeping in conjunction with the banners that we have out through the community. The ones that say we're one community, respect those who don't love like you, look like you, um, believe like you. Uh, so anyway, those signs have been at the pools and they are gonna be moved um, next week. They'll still be at the pools all this week. But next week, they're going to be moved for you to pick up if you want one, and they'll be moved to the farmer's market. So if you're not somebody who goes to the pools and you want to get one of those signs to put in your yard, they, are at, they will be at the farmer's market beginning not this coming Sunday, but the following Sunday, the 29th of August. So until then, you can pick them up at the pools. And on the pool note, we have moved into our first level of back to school schedule. So we have a back to school schedule, which is posted on our website, mca80238.com. And you can get the latest in uh, pool schedules um, for this week. And then next week it changes through, um, and that change will be good through Labor Day. So also we will begin signups for our Labor Day uh, pool swim. We'll have two sessions again, just like we did for the 4th of July. So if you're interested and wanna make uh, an activity of it on Labor Day, please make sure that you get signed up via the website. Let's see. Uh, in September, our delegates asked if we could start a dog leash and dog etiquette campaign. So you'll, be, you'll see in our front porch article, a uh, letter written by one of our delegates, Rebecca Henderson, and she, she wrote a great article. We added a little bit to it, also about picking up after our dog, keeping our dogs on leashes, and just being considerate of your neighbors as you take your dogs out. So that will begin um, September 1. It'll drop in the front porch, and we'll also start um, putting out e-blasts regarding that information. Um, the CPUN diversity survey will be in tomorrow's um, e-blast. So it will be in the MCA e-blast as well. Hopefully we'll get that out to the community um, via that method. We also, just to update everyone, the MCA is an entity that provides spaces for the community to utilize, one being the queue. And we get asked sometimes by those who are our partners like CPUN or Bluff Lake Nature, Sand Creek, um, the Arsenal, uh, the Urban Farm to host meetings, events 
in that space. And we love doing that. One of the other entities that is connected to us, actually two of them are Park Creek Metro District and Westerly Creek Metro District. We also offer the use of the CUBE and our eBlast system to publicize their meetings and to host their meetings. So I, I think sometimes people get um, confused that we, because we put things out in an e-blast, it is our information. It is just a partner that we put their information out. We are an entity, we are truly Switzerland in this community. We, we have to listen to everybody's point of view and have to support those we agree with and those we don't. So we, we have to be very neutral throughout and we just provide information and get it out there the best way we know how. And we also have our spaces open to those groups that need to utilize our space, such as Park Creek and Westerly Creek have in the past. So we're hoping to host the CPUN uh, community forums on Tuesday nights once we're all back to meeting in public once again. So we're looking forward to that. Um, oh, one thing I wanted to say, bringing up the fruit tree map, the MCA does have extensive category of trees. And we have all of our trees in the community, quote unquote, tagged. So we do have maps of those things if you'd like to access what we have in place. And they're not just a dot, they are a dot with what type of tree it is. So if you would like to use that and not reinvent the wheel, you are more than welcome to do that. Hey, Doc, it's Jack. I, I got that map from KB and have Perfect. Shared. Perfect. Thanks, Jack. I just wanted to be sure we were not reinventing the wheel somewhere. Um, and I think that kind of winds up what we have going on. Um, if you want to join us at our board meeting, it's tomorrow at noon. Yeah, thank you, uh, Diane. And for those who are interested in how the MCA operates, I do encourage you to check out that meeting tomorrow at noon if you can. I know it's during the workday, but it's a good glimpse into um, their process. Uh, Diane, thank you for offering the space for our board meetings. Uh, for the board, we'll be discussing that a little bit uh, later. Um, and thank you for your support of our uh, DEI uh, survey. I'm looking forward to seeing that in the email tomorrow. Thank Great. you. All Great. Right. Um, I, we, that was, I, I know that was quick for everybody. Um, I do, we do, I do want to make sure that we give, uh, uh, Alex Foster adequate time here, but are there any questions that we, they can ask of our, uh, community partners before we move on? Um, uh, there's one, um, from Carol, actually, Diane, for you, what's the situation regarding dead trees on tree lawns? Will they be removed and replaced? The, the ones in the tree lawns, Carol, are, it depends on if they belong to MCA proper or if they belong to the homeowner. In the tree lawns, in the front is what I think you are referring to, um, in the front of homes, in the front of, I know I'm looking at a dead one right outside of my window that's marked, um, and our HOA has it marked for the past six weeks. So someday I think it's coming down, but I don't know when. Um, but if it's truly in what we call the tree lawn area, those are to be taken down by the homeowner. And that's who has to take them down. If they are in, for example, 29th Avenue, the parkway, or any property that MCA manages and operates, then we try to take them down either in the fall or in the spring and we have a replacement schedule. The number of trees that we replace every year is monumental and co very costly, but we do replace trees as we um, can within the budget. Thanks, Diane. Mm -hmm. um, if there are additional questions, um, I'll make sure that, please ask them in the chat and I'll make sure that they get answered, but I do want to make sure we have time for Alex here. So uh, thanks to all our community partners, as always, appreciate it. Um, I do want to introduce Alex Foster, though, uh, community uh, communications program manager for uh, community planning and development with the city. Uh, as I said, she's a, a Central Park resident. It's also because of Alex that we've been able to use um, uh, Zoom for the past year and a half. So thanks, 
for that. Um, Alex, are you there? Do you want to? Um... Uh, yes, I'm here. Oh, there um, you go. So hello, everyone, uh, neighbors. Um, I have been a resident of the neighborhood for five years and of Denver um, 15 years. Um, so I think that's long enough to consider myself real local. Um, I have been working for the city of Denver uh, for eight years and um, all in community planning and development. Um, I don't have any sort of formal presentation or anything. Um, I have you know, a couple of uh, bullet points that I wanna hit just based on what Jeff had um, emailed me about. Uh, but I'm happy to just answer questions. And um, I do have an answer on the process for tree lawn trees because I work for the city and also because I went through that. <laughs> and so don't let me forget to address that after. But um, I, um, uh, in community planning and development, uh, in the communications team, I wear many hats. I um, speak to the media on behalf of the department. I do communications for planning services. Um, and uh, help in the doing community engagement and collecting input from residents and reporting out on that. Um, I have helped on citywide uh, projects like uh, Blueprint Denver, um, which is our citywide land use and transportation plan. And I also am part of the neighborhood planning initiative team. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the uh, more the smaller kind of targeted plans that we do around large developments like most recently completed Loretto Heights and um, uh, things like that. So um, once upon a time, had I been here 25 years ago, I would have probably, you know, in my position, I would have helped the Stapleton development plan. And um, uh, so our community is actually a really good example of what my department does. We sort of bring, or, you know, we try to bring community voices together to see what do you want to see in this area? What do you want to see in this neighborhood? And help create the regulatory um, framework to, for that actually to be built out by, um, by the market and continue to support the community through, um, uh, through planning for, um, you know, through zoning and um, uh, building permits, all of that goes through my department. So anything from I need to replace my water heater to I want to build a multi-million dollar development, all of that goes through community planning and development. So we're one of the most active agencies in the city. Um, also often one of the most controversial. <laughs> so, um, you know, lots of the things that people care about with regard to their neighborhood, their homes, um, those are things in that we deal in and we want to bring as many community voices onto the table for our planning processes. And so one of the ways that we do that is through the uh, Registered Neighborhood Organization Program. Um, that was established in the late 70s um, through an ordinance that I think was initially enacted in 1979, but it was basically um, a way to um, empower neighborhood organizations to participate in um, you know, city processes and require the city to connect um, with uh, these organizations to be able to communicate out uh, to residents about um, all kinds of things, um, things, anything from liquor license to a rezoning, as I mentioned, um, whenever city property is bought or sold. There's a whole list of um, types of uh, projects and uh, movements in city work that require RNO notification or RNO participation. Um, what's kind of interesting about how um, registered neighborhood organizations function now is that they were invented, as it were, at a time before social media and before sort of the instant communication that we uh, that we know. So, it, so they they there's an extent to which they were more essential 20, 30 years ago when we didn't have these easy forms of reaching out directly to residents. We really relied on the groups. Uh, that's not to say that RNOs are not still important, but like I said, they're one of multiple avenues that we as the city have um, to reach out and engage with, um, with residents. Um, you know, RNOs aren't the only voice in any public process, um, but they certainly, um, you know, through organizing power can definitely have an impact. Um, I don't think 
that this particular group had a, has had a bigger one than the name change um, in terms of Central Park. Uh, people ask me about neighborhood names all the time and they've asked me from the moment that I started, um, how do neighborhoods get named? What names, you know, are chosen? Who decides? Why is the city, you know, have these particular ones when everybody else refers to the neighborhood this way? Um, just to give you an, an obvious example, um, uh, in the city neighborhood map, we don't have Lodo, we have Union Station. <laughs> uh, there's lots of neighborhoods um, on the map that are called something other than what they are generally referred to by the public. And that's partly because uh, the naming of neighborhoods happens um, uh, sort of as a kind of alchemy of, you know, community, people sort of decide, you know, this, um, this area is important to us and we want to elevate its significance and so we're going to start calling it, you know, whatever it is and eventually over time that's what happens. Um, but what the, the neighborhood tracks that the city has, those have been, uh, those has not changed and have never changed from the moment they were created also in the um, in the 70s, and, and they were changed for the first time last year with Central Park. And that was primarily because of, obviously, I don't have to re you know, relate the history to you, but um, both the council member and um, the mayor um, you know, said, we will be led by the community in terms of what this area should be called. And um, the, in the absence of a structure within the city to name things. We're not a city that officially designates neighborhood names. We designate, we, we call, we have bids and historic districts and stuff, but those aren't associated with our neighborhood map. Um, and we've never had any sort of ordinance program to create neighborhood names. So in the absence of those, the, a structure like that, you know, the leadership said, let's just go with what the community says. And because this group created kind of a process for people to submit names and then vote and uh, uh, you know narrow down to what it became. That's how we chose it. So um, you know I've, I've communicated um, with the leadership of the group at the time. Who they? I was the person who they talked to when when the time came to change the name. And um, and I said you know as a resident personally I felt like the process you know was very open and um, I was really impressed with how swiftly it moved once it became clear that this was something the community wanted so organizing power is something that RNOs have and continue to exercise you know to the benefit of their neighborhood and that's something that at CPD would definitely want to continue to um, to support. Um, I don't know if anybody has any questions for me as far as like neighborhood groups and their role, but you know, as I said, they're one of multiple ways that you can participate in civic life in Denver. You can do so as an individual, as part of a nonprofit organization. Um, the, the city doesn't really have like a centralized kind of community engagement office as it were. And that's partly because our engagement is really driven by our leadership, both the mayor and city council. And so it's really how they choose to um, engage with their various constituents is kind of the driver. Uh, within CPD, um, we, we do our engagement based on the projects that we're working on. And um, we had a major push during um, a few years ago when we were updating uh, Blueprint Denver, the game plan, which is our parks plan, um, and the Dottie's um, uh, Denver moves plans. Those, all of that engagement was done in partnership, and that was really the first time that multiple agencies worked together to work with the community to update these plans. Um, but generally, it's really something that's done kind of office by office, agency by agency. Um, Let's see what else the oh just in terms of things that are currently happening that might be of interest to get involved in um there is a cabinet in the community the mayor that the mayor's office is hosting next week um that's for district eight um and I'm, i'll drop the link in the chat in a minute but that's uh that's going to be a virtual event and it's just sort of a quick rundown of what's happening in the district and um, people can ask questions, I believe, and usually they'll pick one or two things happening um, in the district to highlight. Um, we also, um, our uh, Department of um, 
housing stability is currently reviewing our five-year housing plan. Obviously housing is a huge issue in Denver and it's important that we stay on top of it given um, the various ways that has become a bigger challenge over the last couple of years. So if you're interested in housing in Denver, I would encourage you to um, get involved in the review of um, the city's five-year housing plan um, and I'll share the link for that as well. Um, but that's sort of all I had, all, all that I wanted to kind of get out there, so. Thanks, Alex. I'll open up to questions. One, one from me, uh, your, your point about um, communication and, and the, the abundance of options kind of uh, uh, creating a challenge for RNOs is one that we think about um, as well. Uh, have you seen any RNOs manage that particularly effectively or come up with creative ways uh, of communicating with their uh, communities um, in, in a way that kind of cuts through the, the, the noise? Um, you know, I think it really kind of depends on it. It sort of varies, I would say, from group to group. A lot of people are... Um, really active on um, social media spaces like Facebook and Nextdoor. Um, you know, for, from our perspective, the way, the way that RNOs are structured, the, anyone who lives in your boundary area um, is a, it should be allowed sort of access to membership. And so if you limit somewhat the, um, your communication to, um, to social media, then you're really only reaching the people who are active on it. So I would always, I always suggest kind of having a multi-pronged approach. Obviously that works if you, to have like a, a, a page that's sort of like a, whether it's a website or whether it's on social media, that's kind of like an online bulletin board. Um, I found that yard signs are really good in terms of getting your name out there and um, just letting people know that you exist and you're out there. Um, you know, our neighborhood, I feel like there's always new people moving in. And so putting things like that out there um, that have kind of an evergreen message in terms of, you know, get involved or anything like that, that's always really helpful. And, um, you know, electronic newsletters. Um, it's really, I mean, this is sort of everyone's challenge is how do you um, reach people when there's so many and there's so many other things trying to get their attention and how do you sort of keep them involved um, you know because I live here I think that you guys do a, you know a good job I get the newsletter and um, and I feel like your communication is fairly fresh and constant um, but it, it really varies um, I think it you know, kind of depends on the demographics and um, sort of preferred methods of um, of communication. But you know, everybody does it a little bit differently. I think older groups, you know, that um, you know for that have been here for a really long time, and you know, have residents that have been uh, um, you know that are older or they're um, you know don't necess aren't necessarily active electronically. I know that. Um, um, having like paper newsletters, we, it, th those can be costly, but you know, they do, you know, mailings do reach people also in different ways that don't necessarily, um, for people who don't necessarily have that or, you know, connected to electronic communication, but um, there's really no right answer. I, you know, insofar as you have the resources to hit me, meet people with as many different ways as possible, I think that's um, that's always the best thing to do is to just try to hit people different ways. Thanks. One more question. Whenever I tell my a family member or a friend that I'm on this board, their immediate connection is, oh, like an HOA, right? Like that's, that's the immediate thought about what an RNO is. From the city's perspective, can you talk about the unique value that you think RNOs offer? Um, uh, to offer the city and offer your office? Um, well, I, th I mean, the, they're obviously, you know, two different things. RNO, like, you know, an HOA, at least as far as I think of them, are usually um, uh, sort of legally created organizations that maintain covenants and ensure, um, you know, maintenance for common spaces and things like that. Um, and there are 
uh, groups that are technically HOAs that are also registered as, you know, RNOs with the city. But um, an RNO can also be just a group of neighbors who meets to garden a couple of times that you like to garden the, you know, the local park a couple of times a year. It doesn't have to be super organized or super sophisticated. Um, you know, but the idea is that um, the um, the city has a collection or sort of a, a place to send information that is going to help disseminate it to uh, in, you know, in a community. And um, likewise, it's sort of an, um, if, if you're not sure who to contact, but you're familiar with your neighborhood group, you know, you can reach out to the president and say, I have a question about this. That person may usually forwards me the question, and then I'll, you know, try to answer it or forward them to the right person. So, it is meant to be kind of like a two-way communication, um, and it's one way that the, the city bureaucracy is very big and it can be kind of intimidating. So, it's one, um, ideally, less intimidating way of uh, of getting involved and. Um, um, like I said, for us, it's it's helpful to have um, you know a connection to a group of people. And again, when you want to take collective action to change something or to have an impact on something, um, it's obviously if you have a hundred people versus just a couple, you know, you're going to have more of an impact. And so for me, that's where really um, RNOs can have success is when they um, when they can organize to to bring something together. And it doesn't even necessarily have to be. Um, something that's, you know, uh, in protest of a city action or something, if you want to have like um, uh, the, you know, the something like a community yard sale, which we have here, having an organizing group to put all that together just makes it a lot easier. If you want to do like a block party, you know, having a group that understands how the city works and who you have to ask for permits and stuff, that's part of the role RNOs can play. And so the, the organizational power is, is something that to me is still can be very useful for an individual resident. Thanks. Um, any other questions for, for Alex? I don't think so. Thank you so much for, for joining us. I really appreciate you taking some time. Um, we're a little bit over time now. Is I don't want to omit a, a public comment period. Um, is there anyone that has anything they'd like to, to share? Going once, twice. Okay. Um, in that case, we'll move on to board business. Thank you for your email, um, Alex. Do, do, does uh, the board want just a couple of minutes um, to stretch um, or should we just get on with it? I'm fine with moving on. Okay. For anyone that's not on the board, uh, you are uh, of course welcome to stay if you're interested. Um, our meetings are open and uh, public, so feel free. Um, uh, but again, thank you to all our community partners uh, for joining us for the outreach hour. All right, we have a lot of stuff to talk about, board. Um, Brian, can we go to the uh, yeah the bylaw proposal? So. Um, for anyone that's listening, um, in our last meeting, we put to put out a um, we made the decision to uh, put together a petition that would allow us to add a former president role to our officers group that currently consists of president, vice president, secretary, um, and and treasurer. Um, uh, that petition required 100 signatures from residents um, in order to so that we can put it on the ballot, excuse me, not on the ballot, so that we can put, make a formal vote 30 days uh, after a, a public announcement. So I think for the board here, we've, we've crossed that 100 votes um, threshold. Um, so we've met the minimum requirements and now it's really about us taking a vote to um, and announce the vote and and hold it 30 days from now, uh, likely at our next um, board meeting. Uh, anything that I might be omitting 
uh, there from the logistics perspective? Hey, Jeff, the only thing I was going to raise was we've got another agenda item about um, potentially changing the bylaws to include Aurora. Yeah. And I wonder, just to be expeditious, do we want to pause, make a decision on that change and put the vote out on both of them at one time? I, You and I, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I was thinking about that when I was looking yeah. at the back before the meeting and or I would have um, prepped that for you before. Yeah, no, no, that, that's a good question. And, and maybe that's the answer. Maybe we hit pause. I suppose the, the um, I suppose all, the only um, issue then that we might talk about now is whether there's any um, further reservations or maybe further revisions that we might want to make to this bylaw change before agreeing to take a vote whenever that vote takes place. If you don't mind going to the next slide, Brian, you can see the language that we put together there. Um, just for the community, because I, I think we could have done a better job of explaining the value of this, this change. Um, you know, making a former president and officer is good for the long-term health of the organization by adding continuity and experience to our, to our offers group, officers group. Um, and also kind of creating room for a new member of the board to become an officer. Um, and uh, finally, um, uh, you know, historically former presidents have experienced quite a bit of burnout and this would be a way to keep them engaged in the board, which is valuable. Thankfully, there's no threat of that from, uh, from Amanda. Um, but I, but I, I do want the board to make a concerted effort to, whenever we decide to announce this change that, uh, to, to get the word out about why we're doing it, because um, I, I think we could have done a better job of that um, initially. So if I'm, I'm not hearing any hesitation about proceeding with this other than Brian's point, which is I think is a good one. So maybe we just leave it at that and we can revisit the, the sequence of events once we've talked about the Aurora piece. Is that okay with everybody? Yes. So, yes. So just to understand, are we saying that we're going to defer this one so we get the hundred signatures for the Aurora first, and then and then announce them at the same at the next meeting? Is that the plan? Potentially something like that, so that we have one one vote on two separate. Right. Excuse me, two votes in one evening rather than over the course of a couple of different board meetings. That That's makes right. good, that makes good sense. Yeah. Okay, well, we'll just leave it at that then and we can talk about that once we've talked about Aurora. Um, so committee updates. Uh, I know everybody's been super active uh, over the last couple of months doing planning. Um, just a couple of questions for everybody. Did uh, people feel like that outreach hour worked the, the committee updates at the beginning? Um, we haven't done it that way in quite a while. Yeah, I think it works pretty well. The one thing I would say is um, I wouldn't do it necessarily monthly, maybe quarterly or something like that, because otherwise there'll be a lot of repetition. Yeah, I had that. I had that thought too of maybe is there a thing that do we want to just limit those two to three minutes to specifically? We have a thing in the next month that um, you can get involved in, um, yeah. and if not, you can kind of forego your forego your time something like that to keep it from, again, marketing repetitive. I think the idea of some sort of regular quarterly report in addition to that makes sense, but, and then also having a slot for, you know, if you've got any hot topics from your committee for the next month, let us know. Yeah, I did like it though. Like, I don't think you could listen to what everybody said and not be impressed by all the stuff, all the stuff that's happening um, and, and be fully aware of the many opportunities to get involved yourself. So I, I did like front uh, having that up front. I thought, oh, I, thought oh, it worked, yeah. I thought it worked really well. I really, really liked it. And I think there's some committees that will have a monthly event. So like this garden, uh, community garden should have a new event to, you know, talk about each month um, and probably DEI too. So yeah. I, think, I think it's awesome. I agree with Jamie. I think that if people, you know, if a committee member or a committee chair, or whatever, um, wants to forego, that's fine. But I just think we should keep it at the front um, because I think there will, I didn't speak to everything that's being done in either. Yeah. So um, I was just trying to keep it more current. 
Sure. So I think that just having the option of being able to speak each month um, is a good one. Um, the, only, the only thing I'll add is I think it'd be good to at least align it with maybe some of the email communications or some sort of digest of like how neighbors can get involved. Because I think sometimes like links and ways to get involved can get lost in the chat. So yes. um, I leave that to Mark to figure out. So. Well, can you say more about that? I'm not quite sure. I, oh, I, no. I so I, so whenever especially that leave it to Mark part. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that I'm not going to expand on at all. Um, no, but uh, no, I, I'm just thinking like you know, everybody's kind of rattling off again, really impressive stuff, but I think, and, and occasionally dropping off like an email or a link in the chat, like something that, you know, I don't know if it's like a slide or, or a, a link after the meeting or something where it's like, here are the, here are the opportunities that are mentioned by committee, or at least just somehow reference it in the next email update that goes out um, on our bi-monthly emails. Well, we do have a designated slot in those newsletters for committee updates. And, and those are the committees to, to um, use how they wish. Those yep. engagement opportunities might be the opportunity to kind of double down. So let me get Mark off the hook and maybe just say, make sure if you're sharing an engagement <laughs> opportunity, it aligns with what you're putting in your monthly email updates too. I don't and, know why I wouldn't, but just in case. That's and, a great and, way to put And it. Also, also for the committees, Mark did some really good YouTube um, videos on how to update the website. And I think, you know, every event that we have um, should be in the events calendar on the website and um, you know, then people can RSVP and then we know who RSVP'd and, and all of those things. And, and then also your individual committee website or your individual committee webpage can be updated with, um, with those details. Great. Um, go ahead, Brian, sorry. No, I was, I was just gonna say, and, and to echo what Alex said, um, you know, you can't, you probably can't communicate enough with the website and with Facebook. Um, so, um, you know, we've got the, we've got the CPUN page or the CPUN pages on Facebook also that, and, and if you, you know, if a board member feels like they want to be able to post on behalf of CPUN versus themselves, um, let me know and you can, we can give you um, access as a, as a um, author. So just to summarize, maybe next month, let's try to limit the focus of those uh, committee updates to opportunities to participate in something in the coming 30 days. Um, and if you, if you want to forego your time, that's just fine. I, Mark, I do like that idea of quarterly updates or, you know, every six month updates, something like that. So let me, um, let me think about how we might uh, accomplish that. Um, does, I don't want to, we don't have time, I don't think, to go through everybody's full like summer board planning session, but I wonder if every committee might share a goal or something like that that they, that they put together for the summer. One that I'll just volunteer outreach committee because it's, it's um, timely, but Alex's point about reaching people in different ways was something our outreach committee talked a lot about. And one of our goals for the year is to pick um, three audiences that we want to run dedicated outreach efforts for. Uh, on the list of possibilities that we talked about were um, the, the North End uh, neighborhood specifically, uh, Mercy Housing, um, uh, renters, non-social media users. The, the, these are not all apples to apples groups, um, but those are the kinds of things that we want to try to be uh, to be better about. Does um, any other committee want to volunteer a, a goal that they put together in their planning session? Yeah, I'll do one. Uh, for sustainability, one of the things we talked about was uh, having one area of emphasis to be supporting the other groups in the area that are already doing work in that regard. So like Sand Creek, Bluff Lake, uh, Northeast Transportation Cooperative, stuff like that. And having that be to a certain extent, because it's such a fit with our mission, uh, have that be a core part of what our committee does. Um, and I think we, it actually worked out well. Our first thing was, you know, making sure people knew about the Sand Creek event this past Saturday. And I think that was one of their better turnout events that they've had since, um, COVID has shifted into its new phase, I'll say. I won't call it a, a started to wane because obviously that we jinxed ourselves by getting too excited about that. 
Yeah, thanks for that, Mark. I think that's a good one for all committees. Um, sometimes I worry that as a board, we feel the responsibility to come up with all the programming for all, the entire community all the time. And, and uh, that's really not the case. A lot of the value that we can provide is shedding the light, shedding light on all these other organizations that are doing awesome stuff, big and small. Um, yeah. Anybody else? You know, we talked last week uh, at our health and safety committee meeting about the importance, you know, we, we have a committee have focused for a long time about, you know, uh, uh, crime and whatnot. Uh, but we think that, uh, you know, there there's so much more to a safe community, um, you know, a, a safe place to live, uh, work and play. And we want to understand perhaps the, the underlying issues uh, rather than just tackling uh, issues related to crime and that uh, also meets in line with our ideas of collaborating with other groups who are already doing this work. Uh, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. We need to partner alongside folks uh, who are doing good work and, and work to uh, improve on it. Yeah, thanks, Jack. Anybody else? <laughs> Um, I'll just mention one from the Safe Streets Committee. Um, <clears throat> we've started to undertake with a small um, portion of our committee um, to create some sort of visioning document for safe streets. Um, so as the city um, puts together future kind of go bonds um, and other opportunities where they're looking for different types of infrastructure projects, uh, the, the neighborhood and the community can sort of furnish ideas that are sort of vetted and, and proposed by the community itself in collaboration with Dottie and, and other parts of the city, um, sort of in line with the protected bike lane on, on Central Park Boulevard, uh, more things like that. So, so we're sort of starting that process. It'll probably take us uh, well into next year, but um, we're excited to get that underway as well. Cool. Hey, uh, Brad and Carol, are we gonna get the dog on the bike stencil? Yes, yes. confirmed. <laughs> Good. Do we need no. to come up with a name for the dog? Does everybody remember the dog? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I love it. It's a good counterpart to uh, the rhino on the bike. And, and exactly. The yeah. That was where we took our inspiration. Cool. I'm glad. Did I overlook anybody? Oh, sorry. Um, Shalise, uh, do you want to uh, share a goal from the DEI committee or another member perhaps? I'll just, while she's unmuting, um, I'll just say they, um, Shalise and Brooke um, and Liz Dahlnerker worked really hard on putting together the uh, DI survey that went out to get a good handle on issues that we need to work on within the community, try and be able to focus efforts um, that people really want and, and feel are needed. Um, so that was a really big undertaking uh, that they did really well. Um, and then, yeah, we've got some other ideas about sort of events to bring people together. Um, food truck events for people who signed up for a list saying that they were interested in diversity, equity, and inclusion issues. And then also if we can plan um, sort of an indigenous appreciation day, that would be great. Did I get everybody? Did I miss any? I don't think so. Um, yeah, so I, thanks everybody for all, all that work. I put together that email um, with a bunch of links in it of kind of to do checklist items for every committee. If you haven't had a chance to complete uh, the documents in those um, links, uh, please do so when you can. I think the one that's most pressing um, is your survey questions. Obviously DEI is uh, doing their own survey, which is great, um, but for the rest of the committees, if you can send to outreach uh, any survey questions you have, uh, we can start putting that together because we'd like to do it in the next uh, couple of months, a community-wide survey, as you heard Mark mention earlier. And on that note, for the DEI committee, uh, if, if we have a SurveyMonkey account, uh, if you can pass along the login info for the next survey for that, that'd be helpful. Great. Anything else from the committees? Anything else the board can help with? 
Uh, uh, budget is on the agenda for later, by the way. I'll just put in another plug for the um, harvest map because yeah. um, <laughs> it's not actually reinventing the wheel. This is actually going to be much more um, comprehensive because it doesn't just include the MCA trees and bushes, but it will include, you know, anyone who is growing a fruit tree that wants people to come and harvest um, can put that data in there. And it's a way to just get people engaged to know what's in the neighborhood, get people walking through the neighborhoods to meet their neighbors, to reduce maybe the amount of wasted fruit that is falling off of the trees and bushes. Um, and then we also, if there's, you know, like the trees in front of my house are, you know, lots of apples are on the ground already and I'm going to add them to the community garden um, as mulch. So, you know, there's all sorts of ways that this data can be used. So if you want to pass that link on, um, what it's actually doing is it's go, it's being stored on the internet and every week I can check it. And our deadline for this year is Labor Day. So once we have data, um, hold on, <laughs> by Labor Day, um, we will, we'll, we'll generate the maps and we can email those out to specific neighborhoods on where the, the fruit's available. Yeah, it, it's a really cool project. And it's one that I think will be something that we can continue to grow uh, season after season, um, year after year. And to Jamie's uh, point, um, the maps are the kind of center diamond of this thing. But what we ultimately want to get to is here's some here's some rest fruit recipes that you can uh, take advantage of with the stuff that you've harvested that you've harvested from your tree or um, here's the types of trees that grow really well in Colorado supplementing the maps with other information that again just reinforces this idea that um, uh, these fruiting trees and bushes have a lot of advantages and and really benefit the um, both your household and your community does the MCA actually have any fruit bearing trees other than that one park in Bluff Lake? Yes. Oh, I didn't realize yeah, that. No, they do. We have we have cherry trees on in in the 29th Avenue. Oh, um, okay. Yeah, and they had a whole people, bunch. People, people bring ladders and pick the cherries all the time. Oh wow. Okay. And then another question. When we were doing some landscaping a couple of years ago, our person told us that we weren't allowed to plant trees, fruit bearing trees in the in the greenway. Is Thank there you. any chance that this is putting people at risk for like the city coming by and saying you reported so that you were you've told got wrong. this tree? Yeah. Really? <laughs> you were told wrong. We have two new oh, that's fruit, trees that, fruit two new peach trees that were approved by the city. Oh Thank man. You. I think it depends on who you ask at the city, Amanda. Uh, if you talk to someone in right of way, they will tell you no. If you talk to someone in the city forester's office, they will tell you yes. Um, oh, so the, the, the opinion we have received from the city forester is in a uh, resounding yes. And so I like that answer more than I like the other answer. So we are certainly. Running. Okay, all right. Well, I'm, I'm just glad that we're not putting people at, at risk for like having their trees ripped out. Um, and I'm now upset that I don't have them planted in my restaurant. Yeah, maybe yeah. you have an empty spot in the MCA park across the street and the MCA could put in a peach tree there for you. Oh, man. Just yeah, an I idea. You know, Mark, if I could get lost, peach I... trees, if we could get peach trees to grow in our parks, we would do that. So far, we haven't had a lot of success. I'll, I'll let you know if mine do. Not peaches. Um. Let's keep going here. I want to take a few minutes with our prospective board candidates, Heather and Liz. I definitely saw Liz. Uh, do I see Heather? I don't think I do. Um, well, why don't we uh, chat with Liz here? Um, uh, did everyone get a chance to re review uh, Liz's letter? I sent it out earlier today. Yes, I did. Great. Liz, you want to say hi? Hi there. Um, I'm uh, joined on through my browser, so I think I have my video on. But Oh, you're, yeah, you're I, fine. I was going to say, I can't actually see myself. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, it's a little it's a little strange, but I think I'm looking at the camera. So hello. Yeah, we, we, we can see you just fine. Okay. Um, does anyone have any uh, specific questions for Liz after reading her letter? 
I want to know what kind of vitamins you take. <laughs> Your stamina is incredible, Liz. <laughs> <laughs> None, none whatsoever. Uh, it's just, there's just gen general uh, benign neglect. <laughs> um, Liz, I, 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 oh no, I'm sorry. Someone else, please go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I have, I have a question that I think I'm going to make a, a standard one for all candidates going forward. Um, and I would say, Jeff, thank you for putting our, our mission up front in the beginning of our meeting because I think it's something that um, uh, maybe I should have been doing a decade ago. Um, given that our mission is largely essentially to foster communication um do you feel like that fits with what you would want to do uh as a board member it, and I, and i raise that in part because sometimes in my experience that i've run into uh having to give voice to opinions that i don't share and that can be a hard part so i think it's a hard part for uh, an important thing for people to recognize that we sometimes have to do in this organization. I wanted to get your your take on that. Um, oh, so do you mean in contributing to communications that I might personally disagree with? Yeah, I mean, I, I think partially what we do is give voice to all residents. So for example, there might be, um, in, in my situation, there might be people who didn't want to bust down their street and I didn't agree with them. But I also wanted to make sure that they had a chance to be heard. Um, more recently, there's people who don't want a multi-story apartment building near them, but I don't agree with them. Um, but I don't, you know, and I think sometimes it's one of those things that can be, as, as actually Diane Dieter said as well, sometimes it can be something that they, you know, can struggle with where uh, at times we need to open a forum for all opinions at all sides. And I just want to make sure that people reflect on that as they, you know, apply to become a board member. I actually am often used to my opinion being in the minority, so I'm, <laughs> um, I, I'm happy to, you know, I, I think that actually encouraging more open communication and actually kind of like open dialogue is important, I think, in terms of communications from the group. Obviously, if it's reporting on, we had a public meeting and here's what these neighbors said, here's what these neighbors said you know, here's some context so that folks can assess or evaluate this. I think, I do think it's really important to kind of contextualize uh, communications. And I think that that's something that is very hard. Uh, to, you know, when everybody's very busy, it can be hard to contextualize that. But in terms of just the nature of having a public forum and open conversation um, and entertaining conversation with folks, you know, who, I disagree with, I mean, my, my family are Trump voters, frankly. So like, oh. this is like how my we have a lot life, in common. Like, life is spent managed, as it, my, my life is like, basically like kind of has to work around navigating that situation personally, professionally. And, you know, I would assume in a neighborhood with, you know, tens of thousands of residents as, you know, I think we all discovered over the past few years. Uh, that's that just comes with the territory. Um, so I, you know, I I, I don't think that that uh, I I don't think that should be a hindrance to participation uh, at all. And in fact, it should encourage more participation uh, within the community. Sounds good. Thanks. I had a quick question. I noticed in your letter, Liz, that you said that you have a lot of experience with social media and. Um, uh, kind of promoting information through social media. Um, and that's something that comes up a lot in our various conversations. We're always talking about, oh, we need to get this on Facebook. And then everyone kind of looks at each other. And then we go to Brian and hope he does it. it it's, you know, we're pretty, I wouldn't say we have like a strategy or anything like that. Um, but it's something that we recognize is important in communicating with uh, you know, people that don't necessarily read the emails or attend the meetings. Just curious to hear a little bit more about what you do in, in that regard. And if that's something you, you kind of said that you might be able to bring that to the board. And that just kind of piqued my curiosity just to learn a little bit more about your thoughts on it. Yeah, so I, um, it's funny, I, I have I, I view social media as a tool and not necessarily a place to be. Um, but I just, for some of my background, I, um, 
I run all of the social media platforms for the city council district nine office um, and and also uh, send out a weekly email newsletter uh, for our office. And it's kind of there's a message up top, then um, information about the meetings and opportunities for public comment that are coming up. Uh, and then there's a section on action alerts and then a section on resources, especially during COVID resources for residents, resources for workers and small business owners. Um, and so that's kind of how every week. And so then the content from that newsletter gets chopped up and scheduled into uh, social media posts. Um, and and there, there are ways of gaming the, um, the algorithm, which is always changing, um, but something and, and also maximizing your ability to share. So using a graphic instead of just a link on Facebook, because the links gets or the original post will get stripped out if you're sharing a link, although that also gets more shares of links actually kind of get more views the way that they have it right now. Um, but ultimately, actually, I, I think that something that's always on my mind um, about social media is that it's in the platform's interest to keep people online and it's in the interest of uh, the community organization or the office to get people offline and doing things in real life. Um, so there's always a tension uh, between like how, how do we maximize the use of this platform as a tool to get people offline, which, you know, it's, it's also a little bit funny right now because we're very much online right now um, or have been for the past you know year and now kind of getting a little bit back into like with the delta variant and school starting i imagine kind of online like life like will increase um but i think that it is, it is kind of like a very fine line you have to walk um and think about okay what is our like for every piece of information or every piece of communication that goes out to have in mind what is our actual goal it's not to get necessarily it's not necessarily to like increase engagement on facebook it's to increase engagement within the community um yeah. and so the way that you use the tool to do that looks a little bit different than just saying oh well you know we've got a facebook page we've got a twitter account we've got an instagram account so it's it's figuring out how to use it to the ends and actually in listening to what folks were saying about outreach, I actually, and again, you know, kind of pandemic, like pending, um, I actually think more door to door canvassing and face to face conversation is actually so important in reaching folks who are not online. Uh, I mean, it feels like everybody's online, but there is just like the world of folks who are not using social media and not necessarily checking their emails. Um, it like getting, re reaching those folks is a lot harder. Um, and a lot of it, it kind of takes like pounding the pavement and knocking on doors um, or organizing some sort of in-person outdoor like, way, way of getting together. Um, so, so I think so. social media for me is a tool that uh, is, I have a very kind of, <laughs> I have kind of a, a complicated relationship with. Yeah, understandable. I would say that's music to the ears of a lot of board members, what you just said. So I'll just leave it at that. Thank you. Okay. But I will also say, like, I'm, I, I'm uh, like happy to use Canva and get whatever information, you know, if something needs to be like a post needs to be thrown together quickly and posted and have like a basic graphic in Canva, like that, that's not like that's kind of just part of you know, my way of life at the moment, um, but but also with an eye toward like do, getting people to do something else other than just, you know, click like. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Thanks. Liz, Liz, you mentioned being a council aide and that begs another standard question <laughs> we ask, which is potential for conflict of interest. I can imagine a lot of advantages of having someone in your position on our board, but um, do you perceive there to be any conflicts of interest? Um, well, in some ways, uh, since there is the District 8, I, I think I certainly would not want to, you know, step in the way of any updates that's coming from District 8. I don't, I don't work for District 8, and the, fo the focus of my work is a different section of the city, but obviously we all live in the same city, and so there, there are kind of like intersections and also differences. Um, so cer I, I certainly, like, would want to, like, kind of 
feel, feel out what is an appropriate way of engaging or what is an appropriate way of, you know, sharing the, the information that I know about how the city works or providing a perspective on, you know, who to ask. And I think that everybody, I think everybody participating in this has had the experience of in dealing with city agencies or if you have a problem that needs to be solved, a lot of times with the bureaucracy, it's a matter of knowing which doors to knock on and the magic words to say. Um, and so I think that that, like being able to just provide a quick answer on that, I'm happy to do that. As far as conflicts, um, you know, I I guess like I am I wouldn't be an officer on the board. Um, so I think that that provides at least some distant, like appropriate distance. Um, and also, I guess, like, if there, if there is a conflict, I'm happy to recuse myself from, um, you know, from any sort of vote, if something is coming to a vote that requires a vote of the board, I'd be happy to step back from that. But also, you know, just on the side, provide, provide some context for whatever position I might have, but kind of absent myself from the voting on, on a decision that needs to get made if a conflict arises. Thanks. Any other questions for Liz? If not, um, thank you, uh, Liz, for, for um, uh, joining us tonight and for uh, sharing a little bit. Um, I, I want to, as far as next steps, I do want to ask your patience because like the previous bylaw, change uh, conversation with regard to the former president, our next topic could potentially impact the way that we proceed with a vote on the open um, board seat. It might not, um, but I do want to uh, allow the board to have this conversation first or begin this conversation before deciding on when a vote on this um, open seat um, would take place. Mm -hmm. So I appreciate your, your patience as we, as we go through this um, process. And I'll do my best to um, keep you in, informed and in the loop. Uh, of course, you're always welcome to join our, our public meetings as well. I hear, hear it from the horse's mouth. So yeah, um, thank, you. thank you all for the opportunity. Yeah, I just encourage you to keep joining uh, the meetings. Uh, well, I yeah, I'm also on the I'm on the diversity equity yeah. inclusion committee, so I I kind of keep, ha, have an ear out uh, always. So thank you. Yeah, thanks, Liz. Yeah. Um, so the, I think the main topic, the big topic for tonight, and where I think we'll probably spend most of our time, is this issue of Aurora resident representation on the board. Um, as everybody should know, our bylaws currently specify uh, voting rights and board uh, seats for Denver residents only. Um, a number of uh, board members have expressed an interest in revisiting that aspect of our um, uh, bylaws. Um, and I want to first thank Jamie, who uh, actually reached out to Alex to ask her some questions about what was allowed and what, what isn't. Um, and uh, community planning and development has no issue with us uh, having Aurora representation on the board. So from the city's perspective, um, there is no, there's no issue. Um, to kind of further do, dil to kind of continue the diligence, I reached out to William Gondres. Uh, Brian, if you don't mind going to the next slide. He's the um, uh, president of NANO, which is the Aurora RNO that this space, this area would overlap with. Um, because I know a big concern um, has been whether or not we were being perhaps poor neighbors by, um, by uh, trying to re recruit, for lack of a better word, uh, residents to join our board instead of theirs. Um, William had no issue with it um, either. He appreciated the outreach, but he spoke with his entire board and they agreed that they didn't have any problem with it. So um, from that perspective, uh, there was there's no issue. Um, uh, the other person that I talked to was Amanda Schultz from um, Councilman Herndon's office. And I think this is kind of where the uh, conversation is going to open up a bit more and where uh, I, I want to encourage everybody to, uh, to share their thoughts, which is um, she, they, had, they had no 
opinion on it. They wished us well on what they what she thought was a very interesting topic and debate. As food for thought, um, the question she encouraged us to ask ourselves is that, for one, um, because RNOs kind of have added sway with the city beyond any one individual, are we comfortable with Aurora residents having influence on Denver city policy and business and under what circumstances? So she gives this purely hypothetical example of a CPUN board made up entirely of Aurora residents. Uh, the bylaws um, wouldn't preclude this, how, however unlikely that might be to illustrate her point. Um, the second question that she encouraged us to ask ourselves was, um, does adding Aurora residents then obligate us to serve Aurora in equal or proportional measure? For example, do we need to have, like we have Lieutenant Hines and Officer Jenkins every month, do we need to have uh, a corresponding representative from Aurora Police um, to join our outreach meeting? Um, are we obligated as a board to weigh in on Aurora policy and city business? Uh, there's a recent example that's come up about a development project uh, in Aurora where a Central Park resident uh, is concerned about um, some development on Westerly Creek and we um, uh, encourage that person to contact Nano because they're the, they're the sort of govern the RNO that would represent that issue to the city. Um, and, and so there's those sorts of questions that I think are the ones that we have to ask ourselves uh, because the, the, the more legal issues are, have, have been clear. Um, for what it's worth, she also encouraged me to reach out to um, our at-large council people, which I haven't done yet, as well as the uh, award one council representative in Aurora to get their perspectives. Um, but that's as far as I've gone so far. So what do people think? So thank I you for two, doing yeah. the reach out. Okay, go ahead, Amita. And yeah, I just have two follow-up questions from sure. what you've said so far from talking to William um, Gondres with Nano. Have they had any engagement from Central Park residents in Aurora is the first question. And the second question is um, if, regarding like whether or not we should weigh in on things happening in Aurora. Would we have the jurisdiction to do that in the city of Aurora. Yeah, on the on the first point, I know that they have because of this development topic, but I don't know um, how frequent that is, how common that is. Um, so um, I, I can't I can't speak beyond that. Would we have the 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 jurisdiction? It depends on what I suppose you mean by jurisdiction. It's sort of we don't really have any authority, but we might have more of a leg to stand on in, in making a, uh, an outreach on behalf of residents if we are also representing the Aurora um, community. So it just uh, it depends on what your jurisdiction means. And, and Jeff, I would, I would say that um, the city of Aurora um, does officially um, reach out to us. And so we do get all of the zoning and, and other issues for areas that um, are in the area just off of our Arno. So, so I think there, the city of Aurora would be open to issues that come from us because our neighborhood does um, border that area, border yeah. Aurora. Yeah. And Brian, just to add to that, um, there's, I believe it's a former city councilwoman um, from Aurora that sits on just as kind of like a, an analogous situation, the, the cab board. Um, so there, there are people that live in Aurora that help make design decisions and zoning, you know, sort of design decisions on. on yeah, and, and, and cab and, and um, SDC were formed by the, including our neighborhood, but also including all of the neighboring neighborhoods. So Park Hill and, and all of the neighborhoods that Mont Montpello, they all have representation or had at one time. So I, I think the point on the, the police officers would actually be an interesting one because it may be actually beneficial to folks in the Denver side who are in like the Bluff Lake area 
because they've had some issues where there was, you know, kind of a pointing back and forth across the border as to whose issue that was to deal with when there were like gunshots fired and stuff like that. So it may actually be very beneficial for folks on both sides of the border if we have both sets of police officers come. Um, the one thing though that I would suggest we uh, do as part of this is expand the size of our board because I feel like with the growth we've had, it's getting really hard. I mean, in the past, we've always tried to have, shall we say, geographic representation of covering most, if not all, of the sub neighborhoods. Um, but if we're adding another one and we're already struggling to get up to North End, um, I would suggest we expand to either 17 or 19 board members um, to ensure we have enough seats available to really cover all of the neighborhoods that we have because. Um, I mean, like right now we've got what I would consider to be two good candidates and one seat. Um, and I love that we're finally at a, a time where we need to talk about this, but I think it, it, it would be worthwhile to add in as part of this. We're adding, expanding our zone and expanding the size of the board to ensure that we have space for all the people we want to potentially represent. Yeah, I, I am just fundamentally uncomfortable with telling someone that they can't volunteer their time for their, their community. Um, and, it, and again, it's nice to be in that um, that position. But Mark, your point about expanding the board could be true with or without um, incorporating Aurora into CPUN's um, borders. Uh, um, what do you think about, about that step specifically? I mean, we could do them separately, but there's no requirement that we do them as a single subject item because we're not, you know, yeah. a legal government body or the state or anything like that. Like we can, I think it's easier to do them together. I think there's a natural fit of doing them together. Uh, I don't think residents will object to the expansion of the board parts. Um, there may be some pushback to the idea that we're adding an Aurora. Um, I think it makes sense. And if we present it as, you know, we're only adding in the part that is part of the development that is our neighborhood. It will make sense to the vast majority of people and we won't have that much pushback. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I agree largely with what's being said here. And um, I think actually this is just what was supposed to happen. I mean, my understanding is that that portion of Aurora was meant to be bought by Denver or the developer somehow it was meant to be included at some point, right? No, it can't. Legally, the, the entire county would have to vote for Denver to annex it. Huh. Yeah, it's weird. Well, anyway, it was an effort to prevent that was, from that sucking was, up everything. That was alluded to, but it was deemed to be unpractical um, to do so. And, and that's why they chose not to at the time. Okay, but clearly the developer developed it in line with the rest of the community meant for it to be part of this development and gave it the same name. So I feel like this is really just um, continuity. Um, and in terms of the questions asked by um, Herndon's office, I would just ask whether or not those questions were asked of the MCA because the MCA is an RNO and it also covers the Aurora side. So, um, you know. Yeah. Jamie, I will address two thoughts. The first thought is we have to remember the MCA is a, a, a Colorado Common Interest Ownership Association, um, which is governed by a, a separate set of state law, the, the Homeowners Association there. There is a common element in both a parkway and alleyways, um, along with the storm sewer that are located uh, in the Aurora portion of the neighborhood. So somebody had to manage that infrastructure. That is where the MCA um, was you know, why, why we were included in that process. We're an HOA first um, and foremost, uh, and our job is in large part to manage that land. Uh, that's what we spend, you know, millions of dollars each year doing. What we don't do um, is we do not have any type of r and um, uh, 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 ability there in the Aurora portion. So those 300 properties that are located in Aurora, we treat them as part of the neighborhood as far as, you know, pools, parks, and programming go, but we wouldn't um, utilize any RNO um, abilities in that situation, if that is a clear, if that, that clarifies a little bit for you there, just to, you know, try to understand a very complicated development that is the Central Park neighborhood. I think, I think um, I'm sorry, Jeff, go ahead. Yeah, and I, I want to be careful to um, make sure I'm representing Amanda's um, Schultz's 
perspective on this accurately. There was there was no skepticism on on their part. It was just these are things you might want to think about without sort of passing any judgment on 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 the decision that this board makes. Um, I think what she was talking about is as a practical matter, um, are we prepared to honor um, our Aurora neighbors appropriately um, if we choose to include them? Meaning we've, we've got to figure out to what extent we need to um, also communicate about um, the Aurora library, the, the, Sam, the Sam Gary of, of of, uh, of Aurora and all of the other things that we are already doing within the Denver uh, boundary. I, I think there's I think there's two things going on here. I think one is that we're talking about sort of the practical logistics of doing something like this. And I think we can get overly sort of smothered in the minutia here a little too much. Like, you know, it, it's important that we need to think these things through, but my guess is if we embark on this, There'll be things that we'll just sort of learn along the way and adapt and and sort of you know incorporate into how we do things. I mean, we're not perfect. We're a volunteer association. We do the best we can. And then the other piece is really, I think, what Jamie was alluding to, which is just they're part of our community, and I think we should honor that and include them because to not do that just doesn't. It seems antithetical to what we stand for. Um, so I guess I'm in favor of moving forward with this, including Aurora, and then understand that there will be some things and there will be some growing pains. And, you know, the hypotheticals like, you know, the Aurora community takes over the board. I mean, those, I think those things are a little, uh, un, they're just very unlikely and, and you know, we'll, we'll figure things out as we go. So I guess that's sort of what I'm thinking. I'll, I'll jump in for a second here too, say, I think it sounds like Amanda is trying to make sure we do our due diligence, which makes sense. Um, and I would agree. I, I think the Aurora section is what maybe three percent of of the whole area. And if any three percent of all of Central Park um, had even a majority of the board, I think that would be an issue in general. Um, but I think you know, Jeff, it sounds like you're doing, you know, you're you're reaching out to people, and I think that's due diligence and you know, would anybody really think this is a bad idea to include the people that are a part of our community into um, into what we're doing? I think, you know, I think we'd be hard to find people who would think that's a bad idea. And I agree with Mark. I definitely, I've been thinking we need to expand the size of this board considering how large the community's um, grown. And, and Jeff, I would say, you know, I was the one that always pushed Jamie back and I appreciate her um, insistence um, because I just assumed that it wasn't um, practical and so I think if I, I'm any opposition I had is gone so I I like to say Jeff to that we as the executive committee can go off and craft bylaw change because believe it or not it is not going to be just a simple word it literally is going to be changing the streets that are referenced in our boundaries, and it's going to take us some time to do that. Um, so we make sure because, um, and I'd almost enlist Amanda to do it because Amanda very <laughs> meticulously did it the last time. So I think we, you know, we we need to do that. And then I would say we come back um, next month um, with the change and and approve it and move forward with getting the the petition and the community support. I, I'm not hearing any opposition is what I'm saying. Well, I still have questions about what what the structure of our meetings would look like in terms of the speakers coming in with Jeff's example being like the library system from Aurora. Like would we then double our community partners in order to have adequate overlap with the other, the um, sister, well, not sister, but the parallel entities in Aurora or would we still function as a Denver RNO but bring on people who live in this community in Aurora, like as as when the demand exists. I would say the latter versus the former. Meaning, I think if because we if we we have at times brought in Commerce City Police when there were issues with dicks, and I think we would bring them in as necessary. But we would pre predominantly be, um, you know, at Denver R and 
Okay, I think as long as the, the core mission stays focused on like kind of who we're partnering with in terms of city agencies and then who we reach out to on the as needed basis. And yeah, I, I um, definitely remember talking to the, the Commerce City Police as well. Um, I think that keeps it more focused and, and prevents us from completely overlapping with NANO and um, like having a, a dual function, like a like two missions at the same time. I think this question is the is kind of the the, the core one here. Um, it, do people? Does anyone have reservations about a, functioning essentially as a Denver RNO and just incorporating these additional residents? Well, I, I think we should try not to duplicate Nano. Like mm -hmm. that 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 seems pretty. You know, for lack of a better word, it's pretty inefficient. You know, we we should try to. Um, you know, incorporate people into what we're doing. And then as they, if things start to arise that are important to that part of our community, we should in, try to incorporate that just like we would if there was something specific in Northfield that uh, maybe we hadn't dealt with before that part of the community was developed. Um, but I don't, I agree with Brian. I don't, I think the latter uh, makes more sense rather than trying to completely reinvent us to uh, duplicate what Nano is doing. And so, I, first, I'm sorry, let me say thanks, Brian, for that. And um, I, I agree with what Jeff was originally saying um, that you, this has to, you're, you know, if we think about the nitty gritty details, we'll get bogged down. It needs to be a little bit more flexible and movable. I mean, I think you know, you you include members who are already members of our community on the board and decision that we see what what needs arise. And um, I personally don't see a down. I mean, other than time, I personally don't see a downside to hearing from the police department in Aurora or the library in Aurora. It just depends on, you know, time commitments and what what the new board members would want. But you know what we're talking about here are people who are already part of our community. I mean, some of us have family members, you know, like Mandel's mom, I think, lives on that side of the community. I mean, we're talking about people that are already in our neighborhoods all the time and a part of our lives, and we're just formalizing the fact that their voice that they can have a voice here, right? Mm -hmm. I'm less concerned about giving people a voice. Like I'm, I'm in favor of giving people a voice. It's just the promise to be the voice for them in the ways that one expects of an RNO is where I still have reservation. If we're going to go down this path, I think we would have to provide to our 300 properties in Aurora the same services that we provide to the 12,536 properties in Denver. We cannot serve if, if I mean, if we, we would have to provide the same level of services to both. And I worry that we would not have the capacity to bring on an entirely new municipality with their own systems and their own governances um, all, all at once. I'm not saying I'm opposed. I'm saying that before we would go down this path, we would have to think about, you know, what what that would be involved with because we want to make sure we provide the same service to all of our members um, uh, on both sides of, of 26th Avenue. But, but wouldn't theoretically that, that Aurora piece also be able to be served by Nano because these folks would have an RNO from each, I mean, like sort of providing both. So Nano is still represents them, will still officially be the you know, uh, area, will, will still be part of them, and they'll be part of a second RNO with us. And you know, if that's what Nano does, then the Nano can totally do that for for all of that. Um, so I don't know that we have to necessarily feel like we're providing a hundred percent of those pieces where we're engaging with Aurora Public Schools and engaging with all of the other things. I mean, if it's if it's part of our overall community, I think that totally makes sense. But if it's something Aurora related but doesn't really impact our community directly, but it's Aurora, like I don't know that we necessarily have to feel like we're involved because. Hopefully, by having two in our RNOs, those residents will get the same kind of information from Nano. I think I would imagine the collaboration is what Jeff said earlier, which is like that the issue was raised over email about the Westerly Creek development that's happening. Like that's the kind of thing I think would be the scope 
of what we might collaborate and talk about together, but otherwise it doesn't, you know, totally occur in our sort of mutual area. Um, I think most people would probably look to Nano to solve Aurora issues. But Brad, to be clear, that development is not part of the Stapleton development and it is, it's, it is an Aurora development, but, whether, yeah. but it's not part of the original development. Yeah, yes, that's true. I, I would just say it, it's more of it's, you know, something that Central Park residents might access. I mean, I get like there's a slippery slope on this stuff, but it's of adjacent to our, there's there's a, an overlap, I would say. Yeah, that's true. Thanks so much. Hey, Jeff, I'm just going to do the time check that it's 8.30 yeah. and we haven't talked about the budget that we need to approve next month. Yeah. yeah. Um, so... <clears throat> I think um, I, I I'm not I, I are we at a, I'm not sure we're at a place quite yet where we can move forward with a bylaw with an uh, with a, a plan to announce a a petition for a bylaw change. What I would what I would suggest we do is that I continue to do some uh, due diligence with other representatives to get some additional perspectives. We can draft what the bylaw change is so that we're moving this ball forward and we can kind of continue the discussion in the October uh, meeting because I want to make sure that um, people are given an opportunity to reflect on and, and think a little bit about the point that um, Amanda is making and that Jack was sort of reinforcing here, um, because I, I do think it's relevant not to, as Amanda said, giving a voice or not, but are, are we doing those, those folks justice? So Jeff, should we, should we ask them? I mean, yeah. um, Jack, how many houses are there? You said there were 200. 200. There are 300 properties in Aurora. So, I mean, on a Saturday afternoon, we could drop a drop a survey off at every door and ask them, you know, to give us their input. I I I have never like and and I am the person that gets Central Park United Neighbors at gmail.com. I, I mean, there 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 isn't they aren't beating down our door to do it, and so. Um, I think there are there are definite needs, but it, it would also be important to maybe just ask or put something in the newsletter that says, "Hey, are you a resident of Aurora? Um, you know, can you can you reach out so we can um, engage you?" Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Um, so so again, I'd like to draft a, what a bylaw change would be between now and October, so that we can potentially get to that place where we feel like we're ready to go to the community with it in in that meeting um so i do why, why are we talking october instead of september excuse me september i'm sorry okay september. good <laughs> just got my months wrong um so let so i want to think through these couple of staggered things let's just say we all reach an agreement and feel good about uh, announcing it in september that would mean um, we could have the votes 30 days from this October meeting, if, if it follows the bylaw, the former president bylaw cadence, and then we could hold the vote in November. <clears throat> Two questions. One, do we want to wait till November to do the former president thing, or should we just do that next month and, and move, move things along? Um, so it would be the difference of two months. Um, that's question one. Question two is we have this open board seat. A, an implication of the Aurora decision is that um, there's no there's no seats available for people that we've incorporated. And then that gets to uh, Mark's point about um, about expanding the size of the board. But I want to be respectful of, of Liz and, and Heather's interest in the board as well. So I think the question is, do we move forward with the um, vote on a new board member in advance of a decision on Aurora. So if we might do the first question first, because I think that's the easier one. It seems either way that we, the earliest we can make a decision or vote on doing uh, a petition would be next month anyways. We have to draft each petition, exactly. I mean, each, each one anyway. So why don't we just decide that next month? Well, because we could announce the, we could 
publish a decision on the or the announcement of a vote on the former president one tonight theoretically oh. or we can just, i would defer to amanda as the most immediate past president about how <laughs> soon she wants to be roped into the numerous uh, officers emails i yeah. was going to abstain from voting on this matter <laughs> then i suggest we postpone and let her continue abstaining as much as she wants to yeah let yeah let the burnout fizzle a bit before <laughs> i appreciate you being here though amanda so you know <laughs> i do think we should move forward with the board seat though i think I that agree. if we have an open seat we should move forward and then i agree you... with jeff Barron on that with Me moving too. forward i think that's a priority on who on the empty board seat i i feel the same um do, does anyone oppose when you say move forward you mean vote tonight or vote next month no vote we haven't yeah, next we haven't heard from both both prospects, right? That that's right. We haven't heard from uh Heather. Um we have a, do we have we have a letter though from Heather? We had that a while back, yes? Yeah, we do we do have a um letter uh for everybody to review. So what I'd suggest and and, and Liz uh, thank you again, um, is that we hold the vote on that seat at this in the September meeting. Okay. Okay. And okay. and Jeff, I'll I, I will try to take the first stab at the um the the boundaries. Boundary. See what we what we'd have to change. Amanda probably knows it off the top of her head, but I will I will take a stab and then run it by um, everybody. But I think you know. the past president and the location. It, to me, it seems more expedition. It's expeditious and it doesn't seem like we're trying to slip something by the neighborhood. Yeah. Great. I agree with that. Okay. That was a lot of stuff. <laughs> Thanks everybody for working through that uh, uh, with me here. Um, but it's all exciting stuff. I think it's good. Um, Brian, I, and I appreciate we're over time. Do you want to run through the budget? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll do two things. One thing is um, sitting on my counter downstairs is a check to our insurance provider for our annual premium, just notifying everybody that we are updating our premium. That's the annual $771. Um, the other thing I would say is um, that we are actually in a really good spot. We've got about $8,800 in the bank. Um, that includes um, $1,800 that the fundraising committee has raised um, for the 2023 um, nation builder expenses, as well as $1,600 left over from what we got this year from the foundation, CPBA and Brookfield. Um, and I know that we won't have time tonight, but there is probably, there is a way we can spend um, the $1,600. Um, for, the, for the budget um, income next year, we will get $6,000 from the foundation. Um, in addition, we anticipate $3,200 um, additional will be raised um, for the nation builder. Um, and then the expenses that we have, at least for now is the insurance nation builder, just miscellaneous, like we have to register with the state, we have to maintain our webs, web domain, things like that. Um, and then the communication committee or outreach committee has um, kind of put a budget placeholder for some Google ads to drive people to our website. As well, we talked about, and we will be talking about potentially postcards or grocery bags um, or both. So I just put a placeholder there. That would leave us um, in April of next year um, with increasing our reserve um, by $9,800. And again, 6,000 of that um, would be paying ahead for Nation Builder. Um, so I guess the only thing that I would say is we said if there were any committees that needed money or wanted, I heard the only one, the only committee that I heard was um, funding for the indigenous um, event. And so Jamie, if you have an amount 
Um, if you email me that, then I'll put it in this and then I'll circulate a formal budget, um, Jeff, that I think we would just approve in September. And, and I'd say if there's any other committees, yeah. um, make sure that we, we do have to, we, we don't have unlimited funds. We do have to, like I will start tracking how much we have for Nation Builder 2023. And then we, we always like to keep, um, you know, a, a reserve. So we'll have to kick up the fundraising um, if we need more money. But, you know, Jeff and Mark uh, have done a really good job so far. Is our INC dues somewhere in there? I know they're not huge, but just as long as we're... They're in the other registration and dues. Okay, good. Which, by the way, INC still hasn't cashed our check from last year. <laughs> Can we just send them the same one back and <laughs> or tell them they already have one? Um, okay, so we're gonna talking about approving this next month. Yep, I just we just wanted to Jeff and I wanted to review it, and then um, Jamie, if you can give me an estimate for that event, I'll add it in, and then if there's anything else um, within, let's just say you know by Labor Day, um, get me those requests, and then I'll send the budget around, um, and we'll we'll approve it next month. I'll have Shalise send that to you. Okay. Thanks, Brian. Okay, I, and I'm happy. I um, the other thing that Jeff and I talked about is I will continue. We we kind of got away from treasurer's reports because we really weren't spending anything and we weren't did we weren't bringing any money in. Um, but now that we've got the fundraising committee and we've got Nation Builder, um, I will make sure that each month um, we have a page similar to this. Um, so everybody's got an update. Great. And do I get a, a, a add on about the uh, flyer that I'd like everybody to take to businesses? Oh yeah, yeah, go ahead, uh, Mark. So the fundraising committee has two opportunities for businesses or other organizations to be sponsors. One is a $250 prime view, which you're hopefully all familiar with because we've had three businesses um, be highlighted already in that slot. And then the other is, uh, we're currently calling our deals of the month. That's the part where I really feel like we could use some help with legwork, um, where we have a flyer that highlights both of those. And we just want to take it to businesses and ask them to like give it to their manager or something. So if there's like a place you go regularly or that you'd really like to get a discount at for, for being a um, Central Park resident or something like that, um, take it there. Um, we've <laughs> I've run the numbers on on that particular piece. And for example, Sholan in their first month got 100 clicks uh, for 25 bucks, which is the equivalent of 25 cents a click, which is way cheaper than they're going to get anywhere else. Um, and then I just got texted that one of our, our other uh, businesses has picked up uh, several clients and plans on continuing to be a regular, you know, marketer with us for a while because he's getting so much business from them. So from from what he's been doing um, and he's only done the deal of the month thing and he's already doing really well. So he's he's in line to be one of our prime view sponsors later. So um, I will email around the the flyer later and just wanted to if you if you can reach out to some businesses, let me know, um, particularly if anybody knows if Little India is ever actually opening. <laughs> Hey, just a just a quick add on to that too. Um, <clears throat> those those deals of the month are um, at the bottom of the email on purpose because we want to get people thinking. Oh, I want to see what the deals are this month, and then they're going to be more likely to read through at least parts of the email. Yeah. So the fresher those are, the better. Yeah. Um, uh, I'll if it's okay with the board, just because we're running late here, I'll I'll skip over the return to in person conversation for now because I imagine. There, that might be a bigger one. Um, <laughs> uh, and maybe, Mark, we might just talk about CPUN bags. You wanted to survey the board about what type of bags to put on the store. Is that right? Well, I don't know if we're going to have time for a conversation on that, but I'm glad we're revisiting it because I didn't realize that uh, I had forgotten, I guess, that that was part of our, our grant application. So we need to kind of figure out because there's, I would say there's two minds that I've heard about what kinds of bags they should be. Um, Jeff Ederer really loves the the um, Trader Joe's bags, and uh, and somebody else that I won't name them unless they want to name themselves uh, prefers the ones you can squish up into a little ball or something along those lines. Um, we can probably do both, but it's one of those things that when you buy when you purchase and and give out in in bulk, 
uh, or do in bulk, it, the, the cost usually is lower. So I don't know if we need a, a poll of the board at some point, but maybe next month we can discuss that. When you say a Trader's jo Trader Joe's bag, does that like the flat bottom dual handle grocery bag? No, I don't. I don't, I don't know. know. Jeff, Jeff, can you tell us what you want? What you um, it, you'd recognize it as soon as you've seen it. For one, it's a it's a great size for carrying groceries, um, but it's also kind of an interesting, attractive bag. It's got a lot of design, and it it'll last a long time. And and really, wow. it's just about the idea that it's it's. Um, it's, it can be a good looking bag that promotes Pine. We could promote business that want to sponsor them, which would help defray cost or schools or such. Um, and so we want bags that people are going to take to the grocery store and they're going to be seen and they're going to be useful. That's the idea behind it. So it could be other types of bags. I just use the Trader Joe's example because um, you see it a lot around, at least some of us do. So maybe we'll turn our next meeting into a bag off where everyone can bring a demonstration of their bag and show it. And then we can do a little poll and make a decision. And, and well, wasn't, it, wasn't it though also that it's the cost is very different. Like, I mean, when we talked about the substantial bag, the cost was more than I originally understood. So I think the bag off will be, uh, will include everyone who wants to submit a bag idea should uh, include the cost of those bags. Okay. I'm just trying to delegate and provide some enthusiasm for delegating it too. So if you have a bag you want, you know, find a model for it and, uh, you know, have a website link ready for us. All right. Well, we'll leave it at that for the night. Thanks everybody. And thank you for staying late. I appreciate it. Thanks everyone. Thank well everybody. run meeting, Jeff. Yeah. Good job. <laughs> Thanks. Happy I won't lie. <laughs> Thank you. All right. See you. All right. Bye, everyone. Thank